Can you turn that light on, please? Good morning. This is Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, are we speaking yeah. with Mr. Keck? Yeah, this is Dave Keck. Oh, can you great. Hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you now. Um, okay. Good. And Arvin Watersong is going to introduce you. Hi, David. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so, for the record, I'm Auburn Watersong, Policy Director of the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And um, David has agreed to come speak to you. He is the director of the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence and Firearms, which is a project of the Battered Women's Justice Project, a national um, partner uh, of ours in. Um, in the efforts to end domestic violence, and, and they have a national scope. And so I thought, given the specialty of his project, that it might be worthwhile to have a chance to hear from him. And I think he can introduce himself. I know that he's an attorney, and he can talk more about his experience with you. Good. But thank you, David. Thank you, David. Uh, thank this, you. this is uh, Senator Dick Sears. I chair the Senate Judiciary Committee. And with me, um, Senator Joe Benny. Senator Alice Nitka, Senator uh, Jeanette White, and Senator Tim Ash will be here shortly. So if you would uh, feel free to comment on H422 either as it passed the House. We've had some uh, amendments offered by the Attorney General's office, uh, particularly to uh, relating to Section 2, the removal of firearms. Um, but uh, please feel free to talk about whatever you want about, around this bill and how other states have. Uh, we're particularly interested in the uh, constitutionality uh, under Article 4 of the United States Constitution, and Article 11, uh, the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, Article 11 of the Vermont Constitution, and how it interplays, how this bill would interplay with those uh, search and seizure laws, uh, constitutional requirements. Okay, thank you. Thank you for asking me to speak this morning. Uh, as indicated, I am with the Better Women's Justice Project, and we are uh, funded through the Office on Violence Against Women. Uh, my position is director of the National Domestic Violence and Firearms Resource Center, and this is uh, kind of the, the area that we, we work in with, with firearms seizure and, and firearms surrender protocol. I will uh, think at this point, I also need to point out that because of the funding we have, I am not allowed to engage in any kind of lobbying either for or against any pending legislation. So I'm not here to do that. I am, however, here to either answer questions you have or to speak in general about uh, the process and about what other, what other communities have done and, and sort of observations about this uh, process. So uh, with that understanding, I, I, first of all, it sounds like the question has to do with, or the, the issue that's being considered right now has to do with the Fourth Amendment, uh, yes. not the Second Amendment, but the Fourth Amendment. Right. Uh, I can comment on that as well. Uh, and, and I think that that's a, a, a good place to start and a good focus to have here um, with this type of legislation. I did look at the, I think the most, I think it's probably the most recent uh, amendment to the proposed legislation and I think that uh, the important things to point out here, important things to, to observe are that it looks like from what I'm seeing, there is a due process hearing that is contemplated within a subject. In most cases, it probably would be within 24 hours of the seizure of the firearm. That, uh, that is contemplated. Okay, I think, uh, I think with that in, in place, you're going to, you're going to take, you're, you're going to sort of take care of any concerns that there may be uh, regarding uh, uh, due process and a due process taking. And, and I think that uh, most jurisdictions that have, have looked at this issue have, have um, taken these the steps of uh, come to the conclusion that this isn't a, this isn't a well, Fifth Amendment or Fourteenth Amendment taking without due process. And so I think that's the important thing to look at is you're not dispossessing the person of ownership of the plan line. You're just dispossessing them of the possession of it, and it's only until there's a time for the hearing. And, um, I think a lot of communities uh, give up to 14 days before they, they give a hearing. So I think it's probably, uh, you're probably on much uh, more solid ground 
by giving that, that opportunity for that hearing to take, take, take place that, that quickly. So that would be my first observation with respect to what you're, what you're looking at right here. There was evidently a New Jersey ruling on one of these types of laws. Um, can you speak to, to that? The New Jersey uh, Supreme Court decision, I, I'm trying to think of it. Can you just give me a little bit? I'm trying to think of it. I, I think I know I read it, but I can't remember specifically. I don't. Um, we don't. I don't believe we have that particular. Well, we don't have that one. It's, it's the Stacey forfeiture. Pardon me. Oh, it's Stacey Harris, Harris is one of the ones that we were talking about. It's in the file. From what yesterday. is it called? One of the ones. There's two that we've been that have been brought up. One of them was Stacey Harris. Stacey Harris. I don't remember the name of the other one. The other one was a forfeiture, and that I put that case in your folders yesterday. Oh. And I think it actually dated, I sent David that case Hager, as well. Hagerty and Addison no. County. Oh. No, it says New Jersey. <coughs> oh, New Jersey. <coughs> yeah, that's, oh, yeah. that's not the one that David was talking about yesterday. He was talking about another one in New Jersey. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was looking for. <coughs> that is, uh, do you want the site on that? Yeah. yeah. It's A.B. Yes, Harris. Right. 211 New Jersey 566. State v. Harris. Yeah. Okay. If you don't have it, they, I, didn't, I don't like to take people by surprise, and I'm sorry for doing that. Uh, no, I do have it here in front of me. Okay, great. Uh, this, is the, this is the one that involves the uh, responding to the police officer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think we lost you, David. Oh, I, I'm still here. No, Sorry. Still uh, I was just looking at the case. It looks like this is one that, that involved a police officer as a respondent. And I don't know if the issue here had to do so much with the Fourth Amendment yeah. as with the, the due process aspect of it. Yeah. Okay, so it was more due process. All right. And, and really, I think that important, the important issue here to look at uh, when you're considering something like this is really um, how this is a different, sort of a different Fourth Amendment analysis that you might make with a criminal, uh, a criminal prosecution and, 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 and uh, seizure of evidence uh, for purposes of prosecuting a, a crime. And that's a different analysis, I think, that you make with these types of of seizures because this serves a different purpose than, than that. This is more of a, um, it's really more akin to a, to a community caretaker function. This isn't a, this is an officer who's really taking the firearm because of the danger it might, it might, it might um, have to the, to the, uh, both the, the victim as well as the, the, the community there. So this is kind of a different kind of taking and, and I think this is, a different kind of seizure. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, this is uh, this is a, a, a sort of a statement by the legislature that uh, there's a there's an acknowledgement that that the domestic violence itself is something that uh, sort of heightens the scrutiny about the firearm in the in the home and in the possession of the respondent. Um, put a different way. If, for example, let's just say, for example, law enforcement, or in this case, um, police officers arrive at the scene, they observe uh, the respondent, the, the husband of this case, or ex-husband, shoving his wife, ex-wife, into the wall. Uh, she has scratches on her arms. She, she's injured that way. She reports that, that he, what was happening here. In that case, uh, there's probably no way to take the firearm away because that firearm is not going to be evidence of that domestic abuse because the domestic abuse is involving uh, hands. Uh, you know, it, it, in lots of cases, it involves strangulation, it involves touching, slapping, kicking, those kinds of things, uh, where there is no firearm involved. And so, to seek out a warrant to, to, to take the firearm away would be ineffective because that firearm isn't going to be linked to that. 
Right. This type of this type of statute, when it's when it's put in place, it's really an acknowledgement by the legislature that there's a there's a connection between the fact that there may be domestic violence in this relationship. Uh, sort of heightens the need to take the firearm out of that relationship because uh, statistics and evidence have proven that that firearm is much more likely to be used to, to commit a homicide. So that's kind of the distinction that, that, you're, that, you, that needs to be made here, I think, when you're looking at something like this. That's helpful. So basically, what can you take? Let's say you're at the scene that a firearm has not been used. What, under these laws, can you take legally? Anything in view? Something in the that's not in view? Where, where are the limits? Well, I, I think that's going to depend on, on really on, on how well. On the, the limits are first of all, if you have consent, you can search. I don't think that. Under this type of statute, uh, the Fourth Amendment would ever allow uh, an officer to conduct a search of the home. You know, look in the look in the you know the, the dresser drawers, look uh, in the closets, search through the house to find to see if there's any firearms there. Certainly, even absent this statute, absent this kind of legislation, in in states that have marital property law. Either of the either of the spouses could consent to a search, and in lots of cases, uh, anybody who's a valid resident in that in that home may be able to consent to a search. So, consent is something different. I think plain view is one that uh, that would certainly be permissible here. Uh, anything in, on a possession of so if you're if you're, if you're taking the, the person that either is uh, under a. Uh, a search for based on based on the on an arrest, or if you're just doing a Terry stop to, to interview the, the the potential respondent here or defendant here. If you're searching that, you know, patting him down uh, and find a firearm on him, any firearm in his possession, I think would be would certainly be uh, within that within that realm. And also anything that's in plain view. Okay. Joe. David, my name is Joe Benning, and. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. Sure. The bill that we have talks about removing firearms from a domestic violence scene. And I think where our chair was going with his question, I'd, I'd like to expand a little bit on it. If the domestic violence scene is in the kitchen, um, and presuming that an officer has the ability to seize anything in plain view if the officer is immediately threatened, if we institute this piece of legislation, um, does that now authorize removal of weapons not just from the person of the alleged defendant, the immediate surroundings of that person? <coughs> does it extend, for instance, to the garage or to the basement, the attic? Um, do you see that extension is as problematic or no? I, I, I agree. I, I see where you're going with me, and I agree. Uh, that would be what I, what I was kind of just speaking to a moment ago. I don't think it's going to authorize a search of the home. Uh, plain view, uh, the plain view doctrine is, is, is someplace where the officer is allowed to be, and you know legally is, is legally standing or legally uh, positioned, and can be in their, in, their, in their plain view. So in your scenario where the officers arrive at the door, um, through the front door and are led to the kitchen where the, where the, where the, the incident actually took place, if, for example, the hallway, the living room, or, or, or any other room that they have to pass the crew, if, there's, if, there's a, if they're, they're legally allowed to be there, so if the firearm is visible at that point, I think that would be part of the plain view. The attic and the garage, unless there's some reason why they're walking through the garage, and maybe some people around here and in Wisconsin, people come through the come through the garage sometimes when they come to a house, but uh, that's really, really fact-specific. These are always fact-specific issues, and I, I don't think that unless there's a reason why the officer has to be in the attic, that they're, that they're going to be allowed to search there. No. Well, I guess what I'm trying to find out is if we pass this law, 
do you see this law as authorizing something that goes beyond the general perimeter of where the incident took place? So that in other words, if um, the alleged perpetrator is placed in handcuffs, brought outside, put into a police car, and the officer goes back inside to speak with the victim, and the victim has possession of the household as well and gives permission to search, do you understand that this law would authorize removal of all weapons within the residence, including the garage, the attic, and the basement? Uh, if it's drafted the way I look at it, I believe it would. If, the, if there's consent to search, yes. Okay. Now, if um, do you know anything about Article 11 in the Vermont Constitution? Any jurisprudence there? I'm not familiar with it. Okay. In your capacity as director, um, are you aware of the cooling off period that victims' advocates groups are, are saying needs to happen after a, a point of domestic violence? I'm familiar with cooling off periods in general, yes. What is the accepted cooling off period? Well, I, I think that's, again, a cooling off period is going to be, again, fact specific, but, uh, you know, <coughs> depends on, uh, really on the situation, but 24 hours, 72 hours are, are, are reasonable uh, cooling off periods. Um, are you familiar with this particular bill's introduction through its amendment process? The initial call uh, specifically for five days of a waiting period? Uh, no, I was not familiar with that. Okay. Do you know anything about S-221, the bill that we've passed out of the Senate unanimously that called for up to 14 days? <coughs> uh, no, I wasn't familiar with the 14-day criminal law period. Well, it's an extreme risk bill, um, similar to Connecticut, uh, okay. uh, sure. Oregon, Washington, and yep. now several other states are moving in that direction. Yeah, those I'm familiar with, yes. Yeah. Okay. That's, it's very similar to that. So in any state that has passed legislation like 422 that we're looking at, do you have any um, understanding of what's happened to the court system in a situation where they're suddenly told that they have to have a 24-hour uh, hearing within 24 hours? Uh, I am not familiar with anybody that's pointed that out as, a, as, a, as being problematic. I know most jurisdictions, when there's an arrest made, uh, will hold what's called a bond hearing or a bail hearing on the following day. That's, that's generally accepted procedure. That's in the situation of a criminal charge? Correct. Okay. This um, particular piece of legislation doesn't necessarily require a criminal charge, as I understand it. It is a special needs doctrine, um, I guess, proceeding that's going to give some, my words aren't coming together here this morning, I just haven't had enough coffee yet. Okay, well, uh, if I could just uh, speak to that, from what I read from the proposed legislation, they refer to that as an arraignment. And that was why, to me, it seemed like, a, like a, at least from, from my understanding of how we use arraignment, that's generally a criminal proceeding, uh, not, necessarily, not necessarily leading to a criminal charge, but at least it's an opportunity for the arrested person to be brought before a magistrate or, or, or a judge, somebody else who can at least review the case. So that's kind of where I thought there was going to be. And that seems to be that contemplates the two process hearing that uh, the court needs to undergo at that point. Yes, I, I agree with you. I'm, I'm suddenly getting my brain back. Um, in the case of a citation, an individual is not necessarily arraigned immediately. They could be cited here for weeks down the road. Uh, but in this situation, if you're given a citation, they have to hold a hearing within 24 hours if weapons have been removed. And that's not necessarily the point of arraignment. True. So I'm, I'm trying to struggle with if the arraignment is not taking place, we now have what could be a full-blown merits hearing on whether or not the weapons should be returned. And I'm trying to get an understanding of any other state that has passed this legislation, what has the impact been on the court system when that has to happen? 
I am not going to get it. I'm not familiar with any any uh, jurisdiction that's that's pointed that out as problematic uh, as far as uh, congesting the court. Uh, generally, these are summary hearings. Uh, in any arraignment, there's a, always a, an obligation on the part of the court to review at least what's been filed as or, or cited here as for, for probable cause, whether or not there's probable cause to continue. And uh, my reading of how this looks is, is really a more of a probable cause uh, standard that's being applied here, uh, whether or not any of the allegations would uh, would lead to the firearm not being returned for any of the, of the reasons that were put forth in that, in that legislation or in that proposed legislation. Thank you. Uh, is, Thank there's you. something that prevents him, prevent him the, the, the individual from getting the firearm back, like is there, is there a felony conviction in, the background, in that person's background? Uh, is there an allegation here of you know, domestic abuse? Is there some other reason uh, that the court can identify on the record as why the firearm should not be used? What? Thank you. I'm struggling with this bill in a couple of ways. And one is that under current Vermont law, you can arrest somebody who's committing a felony if it's not within the presence of the other. We have reasonable, reasonable, um, we have what's called rule three, which covers arrest, warrant, citation to appear. And the officer may arrest the person without a warrant if the officer has probable cause to believe um, that the, pre that the uh, misdemeanor or felony were committed in the presence of the officer. And in a felony, a law enforcement officer may arrest without a warrant. A person who the officer has probable cause to believe is committed or is committing a felony. And then with the citation section, we have an exception for the person who's committed a misdemeanor, which involves an assault against a family member or against a household member, as defined in 15 DSCA 1101. And my problem with this bill is, if the situation is so hot or so tense, why wouldn't the officer remove the person from the scene, then get a warrant to do whatever they want to do in terms of firearms? It just this process troubles me in that respect because clearly the officer can, if they have probable cause to believe a crime has been committed of domestic assault, can remove the move the person from the scene, then get a warrant to do remove firearms or whatever. Um, Excellent question, and, and, and thank you for asking. I mean, I think that goes right to the very heart of what's being proposed here. Uh, under the scenario, uh, let's take two different scenarios. Let's take the scenario where uh, officers arrive at the scene of what's been reported as domestic abuse, and you've got uh, you've got an allegation that the that the, that the uh, perpetrator here had his his gun out. Uh, he was pointing the gun. He fired the firearm. He fired the gun. Uh, those kinds of things where the firearm is directly part of the domestic violence, I think in, under that scenario, you would have grounds to get a warrant to seize the firearm as evidence of a crime. On the other hand, in a different scenario where there's no allegation here that the firearm was ever brandished, it was never taken out, uh, it's not part of the crime at all that's being, that's being, that's being, uh, that's being investigated here. The, 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 let's say, the, for example, the, the allegation here is that there was strangulation, uh, sexual assault, you know, slapping, punching, whatever else happened here, but the firearm was maybe, there's maybe a firearm in the home, but the firearm is not part of that. Under that scenario, you could arrest that, that responding to the mandatory arrest, statute, take him to jail, Give a bond here. He may, he may, he may, you know, be in, in jail for a couple of days because he can't postpone. But I don't believe he would ever be successful in obtaining a search warrant for that firearm because the firearm's not going to be evidence of that offense. What's being proposed here is really connecting the dots between the fact that there's a there's a uh, allegation of domestic abuse and there's a firearm in the home. This is more, like I said, this is more of a community caretaker function. This is taking the firearm out of the home, at least until 
uh, there's been a judicial review to determine whether or not this person should be allowed to, to continue to possess that power. It doesn't dispossess them of ownership of it, it just takes it away sort of, sort of and, and whatever cooling off period you want to put in there is, 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 is probably appropriate, but that's the that's the difference between the two scenarios that, that I see. You, you wouldn't be able to ever get a search warrant to get that firearm so, <coughs> because it's not going to be it's not going to be proof of it. So you couldn't get a search warrant because it's not part of the crime. So you also couldn't get a search warrant unless you know unless the what if the person threatens I'm going to shoot you? Would that then allow that? I believe it would. I believe it would. Of course, it's so there needs to be some uh, nexus between the uh, alleged criminal activity and a firearm in order to get a search warrant. But under this law, we get around the Fourth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Eleventh Article, by saying there's a nexus between domestic violence and firearm violence, and that. We can do this, and it's constitutional. I'm having a hard time with that. Okay, again, that, that again, you, you put Have your, I missed right something? Uh, excellent question. So you're not getting around the Fourth Amendment by doing this. The Fourth Amendment, the touchstone of the Fourth Amendment, is always what's reasonable. And so, again, I, I keep coming back to the caretaker, the community caretaker function, and I think that's because this is really the, the closest. Um, Kinship here is that you're really a security caretaker. Let's, the example that, that I would use for a community caretaker is an officer driving down the highway late at night, sees a car on the side of the road, headlights on, but the car's in the, on, the, on, the, on the shoulder. Officer drives by and sees that there's somebody in the car who's maybe slumped over or maybe, who knows, so he's looking down. The officer stops that vehicle, or moves that vehicle, and conducts basically a, a, a stop there, not because there's necessarily any criminal behavior going on, but because the officer wants to put the person may be having a heart attack, they may be, you know, they may be injured. So the officer mm -hmm. goes there to find out what's going on with the person late at night in the side of the road. If the officer smells alcohol, then the officer can then pursue a, a you know, investigation as to whether or not there's there's from driving going on. So you're really not getting around the Fourth Amendment. You're looking at an exception to the Fourth Amendment, which is really the caretaker, the community caretaker function. I think that's okay. an important distinction to make here. I think uh, this is more having to do with you're not taking the gun out of the home because you want to put it in your evidence locker and, and, and use it to prosecute. You're taking out of the gun just to sort of to cool off and, and, and you know, preserve the situation in the safest way you can. Well, I think that's another excellent point that you made. You're not really, you're still, it's still a reasonable seizure under the Fourth Amendment. So basically what we're using the caretaker exemption to the Fourth Amendment, and has that been challenged and successfully um, challenged in any state or federal courts? You know. But, no, I don't. I mean, the Fourth Amendment has now contained so many exceptions that it's really the exceptions that sort of swallowed up the, the, the Fourth Amendment. At least mm -hmm. uh, there are so many exceptions to it. But uh, unity caretaker, I think, is a generally accepted uh, exception to the to the Fourth Amendment. Okay. I don't know anything that, that that's rejected that. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. I do have another question. David, if I can follow through on your analogy of the, uh, the Terry stop. Right. If the officer processes the individual for suspected DUI and then releases him to a home where there are other automobiles available, um, would the same, <coughs> the same theory behind this proposed bill be in play if um, somebody came along to propose that all automobiles should be seized at that point? Uh, let me think about that. So you're suggesting that, that, that if the officer takes that person into custody and releases them... The, the presumption here is that firearms in the home and domestic violence are by themselves problematic. 
And therefore, whether guns were used or not, the theory is in a caretaker exception that all guns should be removed. And my, my analogy to you is if the officer sees someone, processes them for drunk driving, um, and then releases them to a home that has more automobiles, if someone were to propose similar legislation that all automobiles there should be removed or keys taken or whatever, isn't that the same theory under your caretaker exception analysis? Well, I think if the, if the person is post bond, and so it's again, again, an excellent question because if the, if the person then post bond under the, the having been arrested for, for, for domestic violence and then moves into a home where there are firearms, a friend's, a friend's home, for example, with his firearms, I don't believe this would authorize uh, seizure of those firearms nor would it operate a uh, seizure of a vehicle for the scenario you gave. So no, I think the answer probably is not. Um, I'm reading the language in section 1048, the law enforcement officer arrests or cites a person for domestic assault. The officer may remove any firearm obtained pursuant to a search warrant. If the person is released into the custody of, say, a parent in a different household, and the parent says, you can search my home, does this bill then give the officer permission to remove firearms from that parent's home? Um, and generally, what the general practice in this type of case is that, is that the individual is not permitted to stay in a home where there are firearms. I don't think this would give the court jurisdiction over firearms that are that are in possession of another individual. So I think the answer is probably not. I think the the problem here is that the, the respondent, the defendant, uh, whatever you want to call him, he's going to probably not be permitted to stay in a home where there are firearms. He may be in violation of his bond. He may be in violation of the, of, of the other conditions here. So uh, I don't think this is going to authorize a, a you know a, a seizure or surrender or research of, of other people's premises. I don't see that. Well, I'm scratching my head because here we have a citation possibly demanding his appearance in court um, some 15 days down the road. This bill gives, as I understand it, the officer uh, permission to seek any firearms and I'm just wondering what the parameters of that are. Uh, seek any firearms. If the, if the purpose is to remove them uh, for the necessary protection of the officer or any other person, it would seem to me that you would have an argument that if the person was released to a parent's home, this is before an arraignment takes place, they've been cited, this bill would give the officer the ability upon consent of the parent, if it's a different home, to go into the parent's home and remove all the weapons. Am I missing something? Well, I think, I think that, again, I think that the, what you just said is, is exactly right. With the consent of the parent. So uh, I think in any time, anyone can, can any officer can search if there's consent given by the person who has, who has control of that, of those premises. So I think with consent of the parents, I think is probably, then I think, yes, uh, the answer probably is yes. If the parents say, you can come in and search and take any guns in our home, then I think, yeah, I don't think that this bill adds anything to that. Well, I, I, I'm, David, I'm not asking they to give consent. They've given consent to search, but not to take. This bill, as I read it, would give the officer authority to take, whether they agree to the taking or not. If they've given consent to search, that's all the bill says. Oh, discover during consensual search. If the officer deems that it may be a threat to the victim in the, in the case, it seems to me wherever the defendant goes, prior to an arraignment, wherever he goes, the officer pursuant to this bill would have the right to go to that <coughs> residence, ask for consent to search, receive that consent to search, 
and then take whatever weapons are in the building, whether the owner agrees to that or not. I, I don't disagree with that. It sounds like that is, at least from what you're reading to me, uh, it sounds like that is what it says. It, 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 it sounds like, like you're, you're right about that. I, I don't have that in front of me, but it sounds like that yeah. is a logical extension of that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Are there other questions? David, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. We thank really you. appreciate your help and your uh, knowledge of this country, nationwide issues. And uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chief Flacco from Montpelier, Vermont, the little city that could. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Where it snows every day. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tony Fakus. I'm the Montpelier Police Chief, and I'm here on behalf of the Vermont Chiefs of Police Association and the Vermont Police Association. First of all, uh, I just want to say that Vermont law enforcement is committed to do whatever we can and, and help where we can in terms of uh, primary goal of reducing domestic homicide in Vermont. Uh, we've been working closely with Ms. Watersong for quite some time now. Uh, on this issue, uh, and from what I've seen, it's come a long way. Early on, the concerns of law enforcement um, were several. Uh, we didn't like shall, uh, may, is a, for example, on, on uh, our options, but also the liability concerns, too. Uh, if we miss a firearm, if we don't take a firearm, or if we take a firearm that appears to be inappropriate. Uh, so that's all been addressed, and I've not, my understanding now is that there was some better. Uh, uh, direction from the Attorney General. Um, that's one of the. Yeah, there's a. Okay. The, everybody, actually, Peggy, if you've got more copies of this, the, all the witnesses should get the, the right. proposal yesterday from the Attorney General. Because one of the things I just had was there was a lot. They're commenting on that rather than. Yeah. Right. Um, one of the two two points that we had uh, questions more than I had else when talking with Beth Novotny from the VPA uh, was that we wanted better clarity. Um, you know, whether that came from the Attorney General or he found its way in this bill. This came from the Attorney General. So, um, the, uh, well, David, sure, or the Attorney General. Okay. And others. Yeah. Um, I don't know. If, you know. We'll say it's the Attorney General. Right. Um, so, in, overall, we have been supportive of this idea. And like the questions that I'm hearing, I'll, you know, you've been asking, um, you know, Again, law enforcement, the, the police officers in the field, they need to know exactly, um, you know, clearly what they're doing. Um, and one thing I want to point out um, in terms of, you know, the nexus between a domestic violence response and firearms. Uh, in many cases, and, and more throughout Vermont, but departments are participating in what's called a risk assessment or lethality assessment protocol. And so in the case of a domestic violence, even if an arrest or citation has not been issued, uh, the officer provides an opportunity to meet with the victim and also uh, goes into a series of, of established questions. One of those questions, for example, in the, in the LAP is, are there firearms in the home? And But what it gives an opportunity, though, is to have the victim then, uh, through the police officer, make contact with, with an advocate. Uh, but what those questions, those design questions are determining on people that have, you know, depending on what's called screened in, depending on if they say yes, yes, and yes to a variety of these questions, it shows that the, you know, statistically that that victim is of a higher, of a much greater um, chance of, of, of homicide, being a victim of homicide. So that is an area where listening to the question specific to this morning, um, that I can think about because we talk about, you know, it might be there to investigate uh, a domestic assault. Domestic assault might have been an attempted strangulation, and we have evidence of that, and we've made an arrest. But during the course of the an LEP or risk assessment, uh, we find that there's a historical pattern or course of conduct of a variety of other assaults that have been taking place or threats thereof, which include maybe in some cases a firearm. He always, like, let's, for example, he always has a loaded 45, you know, in the bed stand. He's, you know, and, and two months ago, we started and so forth. I'm just providing a different, maybe, lens from which to look at this. Uh, you know, where if the officer, um, the totality of what we're seeing in the, that investigation, if it would warrant that, then again, the move of firearms. So with that, I don't have a heck of a lot, um, except, you know, we just want to be clear, and I have not a chance to go over this, you know, the guidance from the, from the AG. Uh, but that was one of the things we were looking for uh, because, again, uh, if it's evidence of a crime, 
that is already established in the preface here. We, that's a that's a standard protocol, whether we, whether it's with a warrant or without, without exception. That's clear to us. But this is the part where we're, this will this will be um, new ground for us as well in law enforcement. Just as general practice for the Montpelier Police Department, if there is a call regarding domestic violence, do you usually send two officers or one? Oh, we always try to send at least two. At least two. Yes. Second question. It, can you help me understand the difference between, I understand the difference between arrest and sight, but can you help me understand why an officer would cite somebody at the scene of a domestic violence and not remove that person from the scene of the domestic violence, at least even to just get that person to the police station, even if you're not going to hold them more than an hour. I say him, it could right. be anyone. but. If you're not going to hold him, even if you're only going to hold him for an hour, just to get him away from the scene, to calm things down. Our general, our general response with, the, with there's, if there's a you know, probable cause that an assault did occur, we are, yeah, going, we are going to arrest and remove. Where we get into the citation, uh, sometimes it can, uh, it's still technically a, a criminal uh, act, uh, but maybe the threat is not there. Maybe the victim has already made alternative plans before we even arrive, which sometimes can be. It's been the case um, to even the other time where a citation would appear would be uh, conditions of release, where um, you know we just set by the court clerk or, or judge. Um, generally, though, it's going to be an arrest and remove. And the other case, I don't have the particulars, but all I can just from the news, I'm just thinking about the St. Albans shooting. Um, no. You know, I don't know the circumstances there, um, but I don't know if that is part of the mindset. Would that how how this type of bill? Could have, you know, would have that, that would have been providing a better, uh, a safe alternative to that situation. That I don't know. So I'm just kind of um, trying to understand how this would best suit public safety and, and most importantly, how do we, uh, is this an appropriate tool to allow us to provide a greater safety margin for a victim of domestic assault or violence? Yeah, and then the nexus between this removal of the firearms and the removal of the firearms under the proposed S-221 as it passed the Senate. There's a certain, I mean, it would give, actually give alternatives, <coughs> even where there is no arrest, mm -hmm. where you believe that the victim might be under extreme risk or other people may be in extreme risk, including the perpetrator. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, we're dealing with two issues, one of which, which we believe has because it's through the civil court and it goes through the, the warrant um, and certain protections. I'm still concerned about this. But I'm also concerned on the, you know, when I've been at the police station in Bennington and witnessed an arrest, the police officer always calls the state's attorney. I don't know if that's the practice throughout the state, but if they're going to decide whether to lodge or the two, um, have bail, ask the court officer to set bail or a release, they generally call the state's attorney. I don't know if that's the policy in Washington County. It, it is not the policy in Washington County. I uh, said so the general practice in Washington County is that there is a full custody arrest that's made, and then um, we, directly we, call we go, we contact the court clerk, the court clerk. Or, or, or judge. Now, I'm just curious, you know, just from, it seems to me it's, I'm looking at Mr. Pepper, obviously, but you know, it seems to me that why do we have 14 different systems? I assume he is. <laughs> the, the bail bill, actually, that's in your possession, um, attempts to address that issue and it, you know, it changes Rule 3 so that an arresting officer will always call the state's attorney, the on call state's attorney. <laughs> but it's interesting, we do things differently. Um, one of the questions that came up from someone is a, uh, you know, I, I, I just got an email from somebody in Reedsboro, and you're probably not familiar with Reedsboro, Chief, but let me just say, it's in Vermont. It's in Vermont, and it's, I, it's about, they said an hour, I would say 45 minutes for, unless the police, unless the state trooper is somewhere in that vicinity, generally 45 minutes to get there, I, um, assuming it's dry roads and not snow. Yeah, so they could contract with someone. Um, 
And I would, they are concerned that under some of these bills, their firearms would be taken. Not only the alleged perpetrator, but the victims might be taken. And the victim then would be concerned about being able to protect his or herself. I, I don't know if that, if there's any thought to that or generally what's happened in no, that's, there's definitely thought to that, as well as also suicide is, is also uh, another thing that's not directly talked about uh, here, but that, that does happen, including even victim suicide. Um, the, the, I, I don't see a clear path on this, quite frankly, except that um, we are supportive of you know, some concepts of this bill to can we reduce domestic homicide and the access to firearms where it's not clear cut or the firearm is not directly the evidence of that particular criminal investigation that we were conducting at that time. That's why I threw out there the lethality assessment protocol and risk assessments. I'm um, so. just wondering, um, earlier there was some testimony that perhaps arrests weren't the best way to go because then it's more likely that both parties in the domestic might get arrested. Are you confining that both parties are, I mean, I can see uh, two brothers in a fight might mm -hmm. arrest both, but finding that with um, domestic violence with between uh, two partners or husband and wife? My understanding, my training, uh, several years ago, we had a leadership conference that was brought here by Tom Trembley um, on domestic, specific to uh, domestic violence. And it was, quite frankly, it was the cutting edge best practice of how, how to respond to domestic violence. And if, generally speaking, um, most cases we're arresting both parties. You are now? No, no. It's a, if, if you are doing that, that is, you know, you're not. In many cases, it's not uh, a full investigation, quite frankly, because there's usually an aggressor. And again, that's where the pattern of conduct is so important. What led up to the breaking point, for example, of somebody that's been, that finally, you know, defends yeah. him or herself. Um, there's a lot to that, and it's rare that both are just mutually responsible um, in, a, in a domestic situation. So, um, we do not see a lot of that at all in Montpelier PD anymore. Um, we never, actually never did see a lot of it, but um, you know, I, I, I can recall a case that I had years ago on the road where um, very visible uh, injuries to, to, a, uh, um, to, uh, to, a, to, a, to a female victim and made, made an arrest, and then I realized that, that the, uh, the other gentleman had been stabbed and was offensive. Um, so I mean, they, they do exist. Um, and you know, so it's it's. Uh, but generally speaking, there's there is an aggressor in these cases, and a lot of that has to do with um, much better training that Vermont law enforcement is receiving. And now our challenge is how do we make sure that we're keeping pace with what the prosecutors are getting for training on this? And then um, the the you know, a disconnect that we see in law enforcement is are the judges, is the judiciary side getting the same type of awareness and training to what we're doing on the street and on the field? I saw somebody that was a viral involved. I think they were charged with. Assault, assault by uh, mutual agreement or something like mutual that. Mutual fray, yeah. <laughs> both people were assaulting each other, and it was they both were charged, right. and it yeah. was a mutual agreement that they were both guilty or both charged that's, with. That's a specific charge. Yeah. Well, it's, 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 it's what is the name of it? Simple assault by mutual fray. Uh, simple assault by mutual agreement. Usually, they'll set up as usually they'll set up as disorderly conduct in that in that type of scenario. But there, well, but I suppose that right. a couple could face something like that. Yeah, absolutely, but you know, but again, there's such a but there's a profound difference though, to deal with domestic violence versus um, just to uh, to to acquaintances in a bar. Go ahead, chief. The uh, protocols that you were describing and the risk assessment, how long has that been in effect? Uh, started with very city police department about, I want to say, four years ago now. Um, and do you know if this is being taught at the academy? It looks like uh, it is not that yet that I'm aware of. Um, one of the outcomes of the Leadership Institute that uh, most police chief sheriffs and BSP command staff participated in several years ago uh, was that, you know, was how do we standardize that statewide? Um, again, it was a program that started out of, out of uh, Baltimore. Um, I'll put your PD adopted it. The next department in Washington County is my understanding. We adopted it um, not even within a year from various cities pilot of that. 
And again, it's an effective tool to um, on a variety of levels. One is it, again, it provides a, a, a real awareness for a victim of the kind of danger that he or she may be in. And also it shows that we are leaving law enforcement and our advocate partner is that we are, you know, we have, we are in lockstep in supporting the needs of the victim. Thanks. Great. Any other questions for the chief? chief any other comments? No. Yes. I don't have a question, but I just have to say that um, every day I have a new appreciation for law enforcement officers. And, you know, I mean, Joe was sitting here just a little while ago when we were talking to the BLS guy, and he said, you know, I'm scratching my head trying to think about this issue and judges and attorneys and everybody else gets to scratch their head and think about it and you have to make split second decisions. So thank That's you. That's why we like clarity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. that. Thank you. thank you very much. All right. Uh, Chloe White, the ACLU. <laughs> I, I am known as a uh, party pooper. Uh, for the record, uh, Chloe White, uh, Vermont ACLU. Um, I want to say for the record that we appreciate the ACLU's constant vigilance. Oh, well, thank you. In we, this committee. We appreciate being appreciated. Whether we agree or disagree with the position, but we appreciate the, the perspective. Thank you. I, that's. Uh, that is much appreciated to overuse the word, but uh, we we know that at times we can be a uh, you know a help or a hindrance, but you know we we try and maintain our our devotion to the Constitution and to civil rights. So we appreciate that. Um, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on this bill. Um, and as you know, we defend the constitutional rights of all people, and uh, that includes Second Amendment rights, um, but it also includes the rights of uh, victims of domestic violence. Um, and at the same time, there are many regulations and restrictions that we think could be adopted um, to protect the public and that don't violate the Second Amendment right or the Article 16 right to bear arms. Um, and so the ACLU of Vermont supports reasonable and constitutional regulations of firearms, which is why, again, it, it's so important that any bills on this subject passed by the legislature are crafted to withstand constitutional challenges. because. It would be futile and uh, I think upsetting to pass laws only have them overturned by the courts. Um, and we think this position is consistent with uh, the 2008 Heller decision. Uh, the court found an, an individual right to possess an, a firearm, to use that arm for traditionally lawful purposes, such as self-defense within the home. But Justice Scalia, who wrote right into the court, noted that, like most rights, the Second Amendment right is not unlimited. It's not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner, whatsoever and for whatever purpose. So while, um, so while reasonable firearms regulations can be fashioned in a manner consistent with legal and constitutional precedent, we at uh, the ACLU of Vermont feel that H-422, as passed last year by the House, um, is problematic with regard to constitutional rights, including due process. Um, we think the legislation as drafted is overly broad. Um, it doesn't provide any opportunity for a post-deprivation hearing. Um, and gives law enforcement sweeping authority to remove firearms indefinitely unless the owner proactively asks for their return. Um, but we think this legislation could be improved uh, in a few manners um, by the addition of a swift post deprivation hearing, um, which I think is provided for in the AG's draft. Um, removing the burden of requesting the return of the firearm from the owner. Um, again, this was something that we talked about with 221, where you shifted the burden of asking for uh, the removal of the extreme risk protection order, you, sh you shifted the burden here in committee from the person on whom the order is placed to back to uh, the state's attorneys in the AG's office. Um, same sort of sh burden shifting here. Um, and I believe that's also in the AG's draft. Um, and narrowing the reason for removal. So currently, um, you know, the, the bill is to protect, I think, um, the alleged victim of the crime, as well as I think um, probably those most at risk, so really joining family members. Um, but removal right now is allowed in the bill for the protection of officer or any other person. Um, so it's not simply those who were involved in or immediately adjacent to the alleged incident or danger. Um, so it goes beyond domestic violence to any act where a person may attempt uh, to. Uh, 
to harm, to inflict harm on any other person. Uh, so we think narrowing that to ensure that we are, you know, that it meets the purpose of the bill, which is to protect those uh, alleged victim and the adjacent family, um, would improve the bill. Um, so, you know, while due process principles generally favor a pre deprivation hearing or the requirement of a judicial warrant, um, we do understand that this bill is meant to address emergency circumstances wherein those options may not be available. So, um, the swift and thorough post deprivation hearing, as proposed by the AG's office, may be constitutionally permissible. Uh, but again, we we're very we we appreciate the opportunity to testify today, and, and we support your efforts to enact firearms regulations that enhance public safety while respecting everyone's constitutional rights. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? <coughs> oh. Senator White. No, I just was going to say, how would you word that where it says or any other person? We just say or. The, the victims and extended family, or how would you? I think um, I would be happy to work with uh, the victims' advocates and, and others on this. I think that there could be, I think that those perhaps in, I think we'd have to work it out precisely about the legal mm -hmm. language of it, but you know, those in immediate danger, just because I think. Mm -hmm. Because the purpose of the bill states, you know, even in the beginning of the bill states that you know there is this nexus between domestic violence and firearms, and it's supposed to be protecting um, the alleged victims of and, and the family of domestic violence. But then it goes on to say any person. I think there could be a, a, a constitutional issue there. Thanks. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Eliminate concepts like domestic violence or suicide. Do you see any difference in the mechanical structure between 221 as passed by the Senate and this bill? By, well, I think it's the time difference. I think it's, it's, the, it's the main difference I see here, um, is that there is, as you know, a very robust process within 221. Um, in the meantime, while that process is going on, the person may still have access to the firearms, and they may still pose, um, let's say the alleged perpetrator may still pose a danger to the alleged victim. I think that's where this, this is where the, that's why, the, with what this is trying to do is trying to ensure that in the emergency situation, that is something that they can do something. However, you do provide in 221, of course, for an ex parte <coughs> hearing. I think that, again, though, it's, you know, how much time is that ex parte hearing going to take? And in the meantime, it, does that pose a danger? Um, is the risk still very high for the alleged victim? Um, but, um, you know, I, I, so you know, of course, that you've provided this robust ex parte hearing uh, into 21. I think this would also, so that's, you do the ex parte and then afterward you do the post deprivation. <coughs> this here just kind of eliminates the time lag, I think, where there is still that danger. <coughs> 221 has judicial oversight throughout the whole process. This does not. In my right. Group. Right. You've said that the burden in 221 was, I think you said it this way, in your opinion, properly shifted to remain on the state at all times. Are you reading this language as suggesting that the burden is on the state? Because I don't see any language here that specifically says that. Although the A, B, and C provisions <coughs> under small b why that I'm not sure if you agree with that implication. I think that right now, I mean, in the so in the draft passed by the in the sorry not the draft in the bill as passed by the House without looking at the AGs. So, mm -hmm. um, I think the burden right now rests on uh, the defendant because they have to go and ask for 
you know, they will return the bill if the person asks within five days. Um, that is problematic. So taking that out, I think as suggested by the AG's draft, um, would seem to me, and basically saying that the court shall issue a written order releasing any firearms with presumption of release, um, unless um, does seem to me to be shifting the burden to the state to prove that um, to prove that the firearm needs to be kept. Thank you. Um, reading from 221, the, the term imminent is used. And imminent allows us to get around HIPAA, basically, as mm -hmm. I understand that use of that term. So if in, in line eight of the uh, Attorney General's redraft, if the removal is necessary, protection of the officer or any other person, mm -hmm. if we were to put in some of the language from 221, imminent risk of causing harm to another person, so that you would it, it would be imminent risk of harm. Right. I still think, though, it's it's the any other person because if the bill is meant to be for uh, to protect um, victims of domestic violence and the immediate family, it should be uh, go back to rule three. Then. The person that involves assault against a family member or against any household member is defined in. BSA or a child is such a family house member. Right. That or, would restrict that. Right. Or I think uh, you've talked about suicide, I think also perhaps right. putting in the, the defendant themselves. I think that that could be permissible. Um, I think right. that would, just to ensure anyway, that we're you, following it, the intent of the bill. If you were to, to further clarify a person using the language of Rule 3, would certainly. Um, mm -hmm. Limit the other person to a family member or against a household member, blah blah blah. Right. I think that yeah. would be satisfy your concern. I believe so. Um, and there may be, you know, I, I yes, I think so. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you want to have this one? Oh, Here yes, I sent it to you. Uh, I'm sorry, Matt Valeria. Yeah. That's an invitation. It's next on our list, and hopefully we get the care of because we have to break at 10.15. We're breaking at 10.15, so instead of 10 today, well, because we have this wonderful thing called judicial detention where we're actually going to retain somebody we just confirmed. Yeah. Thank goodness we got him confirmed before we retained him. It's okay. You can split my testimony into two half-hour segments if you like. <laughs> oh, God. Are we really that? <laughs> um, for the record, Matt Valeria, Defense <laughs> General. Um, I've avoided these bills like the plague uh, because the, the people on both sides of it are, um, you know, yeah, they have, know. We got these emails. They have they have their positions, and then they fit the facts to support their positions, whatever they may be. And to me, and I've read both versions, um, the House version and this. I honestly don't see that this changes anything that law enforcement in the courts can't do already. Um, literally, not a thing. Um, and. The uh, uh, the interesting thing is, let's assume that it does change something, just for sake of argument. <clears throat> Any of these, whether they're the, the constitutional appropriateness of the search or the seizure in any individual case, is going to be done on a fact-specific basis, case by case, reviewed by the court no matter what you do, because these involve um, Chapter 11 and um, Second Amendment issues uh, that, uh, um, that you can't legislate around. Um, and 
so you know whether or not there's probable cause to seize something, um, or whether or not there's a right to arrest or detain, um, or what you're going to do with conditions of release, um, is all going to be reviewed by the court, even if we assume that this does something different than what the courts already do. Um, the one thing that I and, I, and I didn't come and testify on the last bill that was in here, and I didn't testify on the bill that came out of the House in the House, and I didn't do it on purpose. Um, the, the civil sort of side of these things, there, there seems to be some confusion, which I don't uh, understand why, but maybe it's for lack of probably uh, uh, some testimony. The, the search and seizure provisions of the Vermont Constitution do favor warrants, okay? Um, it's very explicit. And it is warrant based upon state action. It doesn't matter if it's a civil case or a criminal case, but when government acts to seize the property of a person, um, that, that uh, search and seizure provision kicks in, whether it's criminal or not criminal. Um, and then the process that you have after the fact, the due process hearing, and whether you get it back or the state can forfeit it or seize it, um, is, uh, um, you know, the, the ultimately the, the issue, you know. You, but the, the bottom line is that, um, you know, I don't know that there's much that I'm going to say here that's going to change anybody's mind about anything. Um, and, and as a practical matter, reading the reading through it, I don't see anything here that is not already available to law enforcement and the courts under current law. So I think, Senator, you may have been the one who gave Senator Nitka's note. Oh. <laughs> it's you all may be fun. responsible for that even though you didn't testify. Me? Yeah. Well, she has a note saying that it's just fluff. I didn't. I wouldn't use the word fluff. Just because that's not the, like that's it. not a word I would use. Yeah. I, so I, don't blame, I don't disagree. I don't find the source of the of the term. No, I, I mean I don't know that I disagree with the sentiment. <laughs> All right. Appreciate that, Senator Benning. This bill would have a hearing within 24 hours to determine whether or not the individual should have their weapons returned. Do you envision the Defender General system coming into that hearing or not? Only to the extent that it involved a, uh, an arraignment or a flash site of, of some variety. If we were appointed, yes, but if it were as effectively a civil forfeiture, no. Good. Very similar to in relief from abuse hearings. Um, while they are kind of predicate to violation of abuse prevention orders, um, we are not involved in those because there is no crime at the time. Interesting. Still have 55 minutes left. <laughs> well, I was well, waiting for a barrage of questions. <laughs> well, I think you're pretty clear in your view of the bill. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I really don't have anything more to add. Uh, I, I, I think it, uh, it's a laudable sentiment. How many years have you been in this profession? Uh, 17. I don't ever remember. Coming in with this <laughs> Don't I do it all the time? No, I no, usually. No, go. no, there was something else that I remember. It was going on <coughs> that it doesn't do and anything. I don't just, remember you, but well, I have had you say this doesn't do anything. Well, that's me. basically what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. I understand that, but you were being very pleasant about saying it. I, I'm trying to be pleasant. Just in the case of a citation, hmm. do you have any. Um, Statistical information that would demonstrate what the longest period of time was between the incident and the citation date? No. Uh, we don't have any statistical uh, 
information on that. I have, you know, my 15 years of practice before I was Defender General where you could literally have a citation and then come in three months later. Um, you could have a citation come in three weeks later or you could be flash cited and be there the same day. Um, it just depends upon what urgency law enforcement and the state's attorney place on whatever the incident was. Um, you know, I've, I've had times where an incident occurred and then you have absolutely, you think it's all gone and then literally a year later you get a citation. Um, you know. So in the case of this regular citation, not a flash citation, um, how would there be any way for a defendant in that situation to get counsel if you don't yet know about the charge of domestic assault? And I'm talking about the hearing that's supposed to take place within 24 hours. Right. So you have a, you, you say there's a citation or no citation? Let's assume that there's a pushing and shoving match. I'm going to walk through an analogy. Yeah. There's a pushing and shoving match that results in one person getting a citation for domestic assault. There's supposed to be a hearing within 24 hours about whether the person's weapons can be returned. The person's going to go in and make statements at that point in time about what happened during the event, effectively giving information against themselves at that point in time. Just like a relief from abuse order. Exactly. The individual has no attorney at that point if you're not participating in the process. Or, or there's no private counsel. I mean, private counsel is what ends up filling that gap. Uh, Assuming you can locate one within 24 hours. Yeah. I mean, that's, there are private counsel, I would imagine, who, who still do relief from abuse uh, hearings and the like. Uh, you know, I know a lot of them are pro se on one side, or the, the uh, battered women's group who passed the uh, uh, complaining witness, and, the, um, and then the defendant has either nobody or hires somebody. You know, that's, but again, that's not really the Defender General's concern. I can see how it'd be a concern of those who, uh, um, you know, are involved in the process, but it doesn't strike me as being any different than what, uh, what goes on with relief from abuse hearings. And in fact, the, probably what this does is give, if anything, by requiring a hearing within a short amount of time gives the person who's had their guns seized um, a quicker remedy than they would have um, under current law. Because about the seizure itself, I don't, I don't see law enforcement being precluded from doing that. They do it all the time. And, uh, Other questions for Matt? Matt, thank you very much for joining us. I know you were a reluctant witness. Well, I, I was hoping not to have to be subpoenaed, so. <laughs> um, Kara Cook, Good morning. I have a little bit of a cold, so pardon my voice. I'm sorry. Um, so my name is Kara Cookson, for the record. I'm with the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, and I'm very grateful to the committee for your willingness to take testimony on this legislation. Um, again, for the record, by statute, um, the center is responsible for promoting the rights and needs of Vermont's crime victims and preventing homicide and promoting effective prosecution are fundamental to this charge, and that's why I'm here today. Um, I need to go back in history a little bit because I think it helps to explain why we're all here talking about this subject. Um, 25 years ago in 1993, so um, in my lifetime, um, domestic assault uh, first became a crime in Vermont. Before that time it wasn't actually its own separate crime. Um, and Vermont joined other states in enacting these statutes in order to dispel any doubt because there was doubt. Um, that physically harming an intimate partner or household member is a crime against the state. And also to address the insidious nature of this conduct with tougher penalties. Nationally, and I wasn't here so I don't know if there was testimony here as well, but nationally, surviving families also shed light on the alarming trend of domestic violence homicide. In theory, 
the purpose of these statutes was to encourage law enforcement to intervene before a homicide could occur. And that intervention was also presumed to be enough to stop the abuse from happening again. Um, I also, there's a lot of conversation about the Constitution here. And um, I think it's important to say that there is constitutional authority in Vermont to have a domestic assault, assault statute and for laws like H 422. And that's from the 10th Amendment to the US Constitution, which um, says that the power not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. And in this instance, the power to remove firearm, firearms is inherent in the state's so-called police power. And in fact, when Congress attempted to enact its own legislation to address domestic violence with the Violence Against Women Act in 1994, the United States Supreme Court struck down its civil remedy provision, reasoning in part, and I'd like to read this aloud for the record. Indeed, we can think of no better example of the police power which the founders denied the national government and reposed to the states than the suppression of violent crime and the vindication of its victims. And that's from U.S. v. Morrison, 529 U.S. 598. That case was decided in the year 2000. So the Constitution has entrusted almost solely to the states the power to enact laws and exercise its police powers in order to keep the public safe. And that public includes all people, um, including the most vulnerable, um, including victims of domestic violence. So in that time frame, in my lifetime, uh, Vermont has made tremendous progress in prosecuting domestic violence crimes. According to Vermont's, uh, the Vermont Judiciary's FY17 statistics, the domestic violence felony filings have increased by 47% in the last decade. And when I talk about statistics like this, I don't believe that we've, there's a spike in domestic violence conduct. I think that what's happened um, is that um, there's better training and collaboration and resources um, for advocates, for law enforcement, for prosecutors, social workers, judges. This committee and this legislature can take a lot of credit for that, for supporting that work. Um, I also should note in the statistics, you know, just last year there were almost 500 felony domestic violence cases and there were 700 misdemeanor cases. I mean, it comprises a big chunk of the docket. I think the other thing that's changed is um, public awareness and attitudes that support survivors in coming forward. I mean, the reason why these cases, so many of them are prosecuted um, successfully, is only because of the courage of witnesses who are willing to come forward and participate. And I think when a witness doesn't participate, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. In a, lot of, in a lot of situations, it means that they're too afraid. A common misperception that we that I think has been raised here in the um, testimony you've already heard is that charging a perpetrator with domestic violence is all that it takes to keep survivors safe. Um, as you have heard, um, many domestic violence defendants are released on conditions pre-trial. And the, that's in large part because the Vermont Constitution requires that misdemeanor domestic violence defendants are released unless they pose a flight risk. And in the case of a felony domestic violence defendant, they can't be held without bail unless the prosecutor can meet several threshold burdens. There are plenty of defendants who are held pre-trial, um, but there are many who are not. We've also heard and talked a lot about Rule 3. Um, which would at least allow law enforcement to um, arrest someone to bring them into the station and process them. Again, what we know um, and what we hear is that that's not always what happens, especially in places where there isn't um, ample access to law enforcement resources. Um, our understanding, at least anecdotally, and we've been looking at ways to study this more directly, actually, I just had a conversation with the Crime Research Group, is that in rural areas um, where you may only have one or two people on duty, um, and there are other calls to take. You might just cite the person and leave. It happens. Um, and so, you know, on this issue, by way of example, um, the individual who murdered Molly McLean in Maidstone last summer, um, she, he, that individual was on pretrial release for a misdemeanor domestic violence incident. Um, again, um, whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony is actually no indication of lethality risk as a matter of what the specific conduct was in that instance that led to the charge. And I would posit that um, a uh, keen perpetrator 
is actually going to do what they can, and they know what the lines are, um, and they will exploit that. Um, on the other end, in the post-conviction phase, um, non-incarcerative sentences are not uncommon. And if nothing else, um, that's because a defendant can then continue to work and provide support to the family. Um, overall, Vermont's rate of incarceration is among the lowest, if not the lowest, in the United States. Um, notably, the man who was suspected of the recent domestic violence homicide in South Royalton had a history of domestic violence convictions, and he was released on furlough at the time that homicide was alleged to have occurred. So, <clears throat> where does that get, get us? We've done a really good job of prosecuting domestic violence. And meanwhile, since 1993, when we started tracking these things, um, the percentage of domestic violence homicides relative to the overall number of adult homicides in Vermont has not appreciably changed. So year after year, the rate reported by the Vermont Domestic Fatality Review Commission fluctuates anywhere from a low of 10% in 2002 to a high of 73% in 2008. Um, the reason why the Vermont Network first did the work to bring this bill forward, the reason why 18 states have bills like this, is because it's another tool for law enforcement to tackle the issue of domestic violence homicide, which we still have not made great progress in. Um, there's been some conversation here about why we would why we would need this um, legislation if you could um, seize guns as evidence. And that's, again, because a keen perpetrator um, is probably not going to verbally say, I'm going to kill you, <laughs> especially in the, um, in the presence of law enforcement, if that were the case. Um, maybe, probably you're not going to say it to somebody else. In fact, as far as everybody else is concerned, the best way to maintain control of the situation is to look like um, you have control and to be very presentable. And in fact, they don't have to tell the victim who maybe they've lived with for a long time that they're going to kill them because they have a lot of other ways to do that that don't require actual words. Um, all of these cases are complicated because they've been hidden in the home for so long. <clears throat> and that's in part why it's really hard for law enforcement officers to assess risk on the scene. It's because they require further development um, and investigation, talking not just to the victim, but also to other family members who may have witnessed things. Um, they're complicated. And again, that's why giving law enforcement the tools to at least remove um, firearms from the scene helps to provide the time that's necessary um, to adequately um, assess the case, help the victim understand um, his or her own safety risks, and make better safety plans. Um, after taking testimony at the public meeting, uh, members of the committee are well versed in the economic and social impacts of domestic violence and domestic violence homicide, including the generational consequences when children witness these acts. But beyond the material consequences, um, failing to offer better tools to prevent domestic violence homicide and support survivors who cooperate with law enforcement also threatens the rule of law. If we want the positive trend of domestic violence prosecution to continue in this state, if we want survivors to feel safe coming forward and participating in the criminal process as witnesses, the criminal justice system can and must do more to keep them safe. When the system prosecutes domestic violence without taking corresponding safety measures, it can actually do more harm than good. Um, I want to address a few other points before I conclude um, that were raised, and I'm mindful of your time today. Um, the ACLU has um, recommended removing the any other person language from the uh, authorization, from the scope of that authorization. And I think the, the rationale for why that's there, again, is that it's difficult to discern um, at a, we've been using this term, hot scene, who exactly um, could be under threat. Um, you know, the person who, who could be under threat is the neighbor who called law enforcement. Um, the person who could be under threat could be um, the victim's family, who that individual knows might support them in uh, trying to get safe um, and break the coercion. Um, you know, I, I also would be remiss if I didn't point to um, 
the Essex school shooting over a decade ago. You know, these, these issues are all connected. Um, domestic violence, in that case, um, it was a domestic violence case that leaked over into a school, and it led to um, the um, mother of the woman who was involved in that um, relationship being murdered. And um, that, that's our most um, uh, violent school shooting in Vermont, and, and there is that nexus and that connection. I think um, this, the bill itself is discretionary. It's a may on the part of law enforcement, and I think we do a lot of work in this state to train law enforcement, um, both on Fourth Amendment and um, in domestic violence situations. You heard um, Chief Fakos talk about the training that his department has undertaken and the policies that they've enacted, and I would trust them to use that language um, and use their discretion appropriately. Um, I don't think that the scope is too broad. Um, the other thing I think that it's just really important to make clear here is um, that I think it has led to some confusion is the difference between searches and seizures. Um, as the Fourth Amendment addresses both issues. So as far as searching a premises, um, regardless of what you do in statute, there's going to be Fourth Amendment considerations. Sitting here today, I haven't been charged with a crime. I could call the SP right now and say, come to my home and walk through my house and look through it if you'd like. And if they felt like doing that, um, they could. I could authorize the state at any time to come and search my home, to search my person. I, could, I can, can fully consent to that. The actual seizure of things is a separate issue. And what this bill is getting at is the scope of what can be seized. And it's authorizing the, the seizure of weapons. And I respect uh, the Defender General, by the way, for preserving his record here to appeal this. <laughs> but the intention is to seize weapons beyond weapons that may have been used in the actual commission of a crime. Because as you've heard in testimony, um, these situations, domestic violence situations, are different. And we know statistically that where there is ready access to firearms, there is a greater likelihood of um, homicide, not just because this is a domestic violence situation, because law enforcement has intervened in that situation. And they've broken the power and control that that perpetrator has spent time creating over that victim. That's, that's the reason um, why in other states, legislators, legislatures have, um, have found that there is a compelling state interest in acknowledging that nexus. Um, there is an example about automobiles uh, when the, um, the director at the Better Women's Justice Project was testifying. You actually could, I think, um, statutorily, again, setting aside the, the search issue, but as a matter of seizure, on a DUI case, you you know you probably could um, grant authority to um, seize seize the vehicle. I think we don't for a lot of other practical reasons. There's a lot of policy reasons why we don't do that. Animal cruelty cases. If you're charged with animal cruelty, um, not only can you not have the animal that you are abusing in your home, you probably can't have any animals in your home, and all those animals would be seized. I mean, that's the authority. Well. Yeah, you know, child cruelty. You could, right, that you're not going to have any kids in your home while the, while the matter's pending. Um, it's, a, it's a similar um, issue, but I just want to clarify that um, I don't think what this legislation is getting at is um, authorizing um, seizure, or searches, rather, that aren't allowed beyond the Fourth Amendment. What it is allowing is a civil seizure process attendant think, to the criminal process. I think lawyers of both sides probably would argue either side to get a conclusion here and you have to use your own judgment as a legislator as to what the right thing to do is. But I am, I am, I think, I would disagree with you on any other person. I do have some agreement with the uh, ACLU that is so broad. Uh, 
I understand what you're saying, and maybe the rule three definition doesn't fit everything you'd like it to, but any other person is, is very broad. Um, and that, um, so I, I think we have to narrow that to some extent. And I appreciate that. I <clears throat> but otherwise, I, uh, and thank you for the history lesson, because I remember 1993, I didn't remember it was 1993, I thought it was 95, but, it's, but that's good history lesson. Sure. Um, I remember when that happened, and that, was, that started a sea change, and the laws began to change progressively over those years regarding domestic violence. No. Carrie, we've used two um, examples from history. One was the Maidstone case, the other was the South Worldland case. In the Maidstone situation, um, do you know how the victim died in that case? Um, my understanding from reading the press reports is that the victim was both stabbed and shot. And the um, South Wilton case? Um, my understanding is that the victim was shot in the back. Both of those situations, if my memory is correct, involved people who had previously been convicted of domestic assault. Am I safe in saying that? Um, you know, I actually, I think you may be right on both of the, in both of those instances, and right would otherwise not be entitled to um, to own a firearm if they were convicted of a felony. So, my question then would be: If we passed this piece of legislation, how would this piece of legislation have helped in either one of those cases? I didn't testify that this legislation would have helped in either one of those cases necessarily, and I did that thoughtfully because. Um, what this is about is about access, about limiting access to the most ready um, uh, firearms. I don't think anyone is under any illusion that um, despite what the legislature um, does or doesn't do here, that um, people can always find access to, um, to illegal firearms and um, can try to get access to firearms from other sources. I Nonetheless, though, um, this legislation is um, trying to get at the low-hanging fruit, if you will, um, the firearms that are in the home. I just wanted to clarify. Sure. The um, other question I have is the Attorney General has given us a proposed amendment. Are you in favor of that or not? Yes, thank you. Um, that brings up another question, maybe because I've spent some time with both you and Auburn, and my understanding has been all along that an average five-day waiting period is the proper cooling off time period. And the Attorney General's amendment calls for a 24-hour period. Is there some reason why you would support that and move away from where you were before? I'm really glad you asked. Okay. Um, because what this is, what this is doing, um, the initial legislation um, was requiring that a hearing um, with respect to the weapon, but not necessarily um, the criminal arraignment, happen within five days. Um, whereas what the Attorney General's um, proposal is actually doing is it's requiring that the crime um, that is cited, you know, that the citation be answered within 24 hours. So what can happen then, um, well, the next business day rather. Um, what can happen then at the next business day when the case is arraigned is that um, conditions of release um, can be issued saying that, they're, that that individual can't have a firearm during the pendency of pretrial. And so um, that actually, um, if that were the case, if that did happen, then we've addressed um, that five-day waiting period concern. Um, so it's really a win-win. It means that the issue of the taking can be addressed expediently and likewise um, the assurance on the part of the victim one way or another as to whether or not the firearm is going to be seized is also addressed. Okay, thank you. I don't know how I get all The other thing I wanted to address is there's this, well, do you have time? I'm sorry. Actually, um, we are supposed to go up to judicial retention, but it could be brief or come sure. back tomorrow or whatever. I think this is pretty brief. Okay. Um, you've asked all your other witnesses today. Um, why do we need uh, 422 if they're if 
if we were, we've already done some really great work on 221. And um, in addition to the time frames, um, you know, the other thing that I think is um, really important to raise is that in 422, law enforcement has already found that that individual has committed a crime. I mean, whether or not well, we, probable cause. they probable cause that a crime, they, based on their investigation and their training, probable cause that a crime has occurred and that, and they're um, willing to uh, refer that matter to the prosecutor. Um, whereas in 221, in my understanding, a big part of what that legislation is getting out of situations where a crime is yet to occur. And based on that, the further standard um, that uh, law enforcement and the and the uh, hearing um, individual is going to have to kind of look at long ranges. Okay, um, where no crime has occurred, is there an imminent risk of extreme danger? Mm -hmm. Which is a high threshold right. um, versus in 422, um, is it is it reasonably necessary to remove fire for protection? Why, the reason why states have 422 on the cases where domestic violence crime has occurred is because we already know that there's a risk of extreme danger in these cases statistically. And so we're not requiring the higher um, standard. And the other reason is, you know, as an evidentiary matter, like I said, where there is this domestic relationship and where these parties communicate through the wink of an eye, um, through the, um, the belt left on the table. It's not likely like it might be likely in the other type of scenario you're looking at in 221 that um, the alleged perpetrator is going to say, I'm going to kill you and I'm going to kill you tomorrow. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree that there are differences. There are similarities in terms of when it might be used and it could be used. The problem that I've had all along for two, two is not when somebody's arrested, it's when somebody is cited. And if they're, you know, I think the Attorney General's proposal improves that a great deal. Because generally, I think when somebody is cited for domestic violence, it usually indicates that the officer views it somewhat differently than when that officer believes that, it, that there is actual um, assault took place, et cetera. And that's many times when somebody is cited, and, and I know that the network works with victims who um, frequently change their mind or for whatever reason decide they don't want to provide evidence to the state's attorney. <clears throat> and in those cases, it goes away. Um, and may come back again or not, but um, generally speaking, that's the problem I had with the bill and the citing. So that's, uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but um, it's a little different, I think, when you have the proof that, you know, particularly if it's a arrest and you believe that there's a felony committed, et cetera. I think that, you know, not all domestic violence cases are similar. In fact, I would agree with the attorney, with the uh, defender general, that they're all fact specific. That, they really are. You know, it's hard to make generalizations. Well, the thing is, when you, when the law enforcement officer responds to the scene, what they're seeing is the tip right. of whatever iceberg might be below. Right. I appreciate that, and uh, we're going to end. So Thank we'll you. Get to the. Judicial retention operated by Senator Nick. That's right. Chip Conquest today. Oh, yes, Chip. Are you no, I'm saying something too, but oh. he's, he's the proposal from the Attorney General's office, which I'm happy to hear any testimony you want to provide. But I think we're particularly interested in the 24 hour journal. Okay. Uh, for the record, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to this bill. I, I really have in front of me the Attorney General's amendment. I have the original 422, and 422 is it came out of H675. Oh, so. no. that, that one we're not paying attention to. All right. Then I won't pay attention to it. At this point, um, I think our focus is on as passed by the House. And, uh, All right. 
Because I know that Senator and Ben. And the uh, Attorney General's proposal. And then we have a few new drafts. But. Okay. Uh, because I know Senator <laughs> Benning was referring to a five-day hearing, and so I have both those uh, bills in front of me. And I would say, and I think uh, probably this committee knows probably better than, than almost any other committee, that uh, the Defender General and myself, uh, Matt Valeria, don't always see eye to eye on, on issues that yeah. come before the committee. No. Um, but I, I will say that to some extent I agree with, uh, with his uh, comments earlier this morning. Um, I will say this, that I think the addition of uh, paragraph, uh, subparagraph B, uh, beginning at line 14, uh, the idea of bringing the domestic violence cases into court uh, the day following the incident is, would be a significant step in the right direction. Um, these cases are going to come into the court in any event. Uh, so all we're really doing is uh, speeding up the pro process of that initial appearance. And so I do not see that as having uh, an impact uh, on the court. Um, and I think that in, because of the nature of these offenses, uh, that that would be an appropriate step and one that would, I think, address a lot of the, the concerns that, that bring folks here uh, and uh, would address those issues. In, in a timely fashion. Um, I do think, and I know there's been uh, testimony, I haven't obviously sat through all of the testimony. Uh, there's discussions of um, the relationship of this uh, bill in either form with uh, S221 as passed by this committee. And I view them as really two uh, separate uh, situations, two different sets of circumstances. And I say that because as you read the first sentence in either of these uh, versions of the current bill uh, under A1 or A, it says when a law enforcement officer arrests, cites, or obtains an arrest warrant for a person for domestic by, uh, assault, uh, that changes the, the, um, the issues uh, from a non-criminal uh, offense under 221 to a criminal offense and it triggers uh, a whole different set of circumstances. And um, so I, I see this clearly separate and apart and distinct from uh, 221 or the types of situations that 221 is designed to address. And because, uh, as I said, of the nature of the offense, um, bringing them in the next day um, is something that I do not believe would have an adverse impact on the court, and I think it's appropriate. Can, can I just say something? Nope. Um, you're, and I just want to clarify this because people are hearing this and listening to this. It's always, is it not always the next business day? Yes, it is. Okay. I think really people hearing this keep thinking it'll be the next day. Many people, not people in this room necessarily, but other people around. No, it, it would be the business next day in the language on line 15. Yeah, well. I mean, I think for the lay person reading this on the outside, they think it's the next day. Well, and, and the reality is... So at least what we're saying here... It, it would be the next business day. And the reality is, as I look at, uh, for instance, the language on line 14, uh, you could even simplify it more by saying, arrested for domestic assault shall be arraigned. That would cover both those that are arrested and flash cited or those that are arrested and lodged and would come in on a, a lodging. So you would strike the word cited? I, I don't think it's necessary. Citing is just a way to bring someone before the court. The issue is uh, if they're arrested, if they're taken into custody, uh, then they will either subsequently be um, lodged if a monetary bail is warranted, um, or they could still be cited um, either before or after contact with a judicial officer. What if they're cited for two weeks from Monday? Well, obviously then that, that would that if we take out the term cited, in some cases, misdemeanor cases, the law enforcement officer may choose to cite two weeks from now. I, I'm wondering if do we mess that up in any way? You know, in my opinion, no, because the key language for me is shall be arraigned on the next business day. Um, you could say af uh, after. I mean, sometimes the they go to a situation, 
my understanding, I've never been to one, but sometimes my understanding is they get to a situation where they believe a crime has been committed and they want to cite that person and then the state's attorney looks at the charge and whatever and or they um, the victim may choose not to even want to you know testify against the perpetrator so you got all and, and frequently that site might be two weeks later something of that nature and i just want to make sure that um, we don't force those into in this language that we don't force those cases into court the next business day when the state's attorney may not even have developed the case or lack thereof. Well, if you leave it in as cited, uh, you're I, going to I would be much more comfortable taking the word cite out. But it will still say uh, arraigned on the next business day. That, that's the offer. If they're arrested. But arrested can mean they're uh, at the scene, uh, they're taken into custody, taken down to the station. That is the formal arrest. Then the question is, are they uh, lodged or are they cited? And if you leave the language in, arraigned on the next business day, they will be brought in the next right. day. But people who are cited for two weeks from today wouldn't have to come in the next business day. Uh, it, right now it says shall be arraigned on the next business right. day after citation. Right. Um, I, I, my sense is that if you, to address the issues yes. that I understand are motivating. Well, I'd, I'd ask the Attorney General and the State's Attorney and perhaps any other groups to work on this because I think you hit a point where I, 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 I think you're right in taking out the word cite if as long as it's covered anybody who's arrested on that day, it, whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony domestic violence, under Rule 3. It still would not prevent someone from being, if they are arrested, to be cited in the next day. It would, it would still right. be the state's attorney. But you could well, still cite somebody 14 days or whatever it may be. You, you could. It, certainly you could, <clears throat> unless you mandate as part of right. this. That's the this thing I don't want to do is where a police officer, you know, there are many cases where they cite, I believe, where they may want to have more time to gather evidence, to other witnesses, talk to other people, <coughs> so they're not ready to arrest and have somebody arraigned. And, and now I understand what you're saying, and I think it ultimately comes a policy decision on part of this committee. Do we want to say that domestic violence cases should be arraigned the day after the incident? And that's something the committee would have to consider. But I understand well, you're not sure that I want to have a carte blanche. I want to give some flexibility for the cases that may need to be built. In other words, you go to court and the judge says, I don't think there's probable cause here in this is the case. Uh, certainly that can happen, but um, the domestic violence cases, certainly in my experience, are usually not complicated fact patterns that preclude somebody from making the, the decision the night before uh, whether or not there's probable cause. But, well, you know, it certainly can happen. But, then the issue becomes, uh, if it says arraigned on the next business day, then the hearing that's called for under Section C would not occur. Uh, it would occur at arraignment, but it would occur under your scenario perhaps two weeks later. Yeah. Um, and I, I, again, that's that's a, well, a decision. Well, from law enforcement is that cases are fact They are. And that, you know, maybe reasons why the court would want to wait. I mean, the uh, law enforcement officer would want to wait. And, and there may be. that. All I'm saying is that if the way it is structured now to come in after, right. uh, that would not impose any impact that, that I can see on the court. Okay. And I think the nature of these proceedings lends themselves to being brought in as sooner rather than later. So, okay. But I, and I would also tell you that whether they come in the next day or at arraignment two weeks later, um, because 
one of the conditions of release, no doubt, would be no possession of firearms. And therefore, the hearing that you've talked about, Senator Benning, I don't think would ever be a true hearing um, if they're at an arraignment. If someone, if the incident involves firearms, I hesitate to use the word guarantee, but I will tell you that I cannot imagine a court not imposing a condition of release that they not possess firearms. That's the extent of the hearing. We're not going to ask whether the firearms that may be in possession of police were taken legally or beyond the scope of any legal search. That would not be an issue for us at that stage. It would simply be this person cannot possess firearms. And in fact, uh, I'm sure there are some judges who just by the very nature of a domestic violence case, even if firearms are not uh, referred to in the affidavit, uh, that some judges, because of the nature of the offense, would have a standard condition that says that you cannot possess firearms while this case is pending. So <clears throat> what you're saying is you've got that power now already. We have that power now, and I, I wouldn't want this committee or anyone to think there's going to be this hearing on returning the firearms, if it's at an arraignment proceeding, that will be the nature of the hearing. And it's not an issue for us how these guns were acquired uh, at that point. But that leads, originally this bill was designed for a five-day cooling off period. Now we have, under this scenario, as I understand it, a there's no time period. It could be years. Right. Am I reading something into this that's not there? Well, what I see is the triggering event as opposed to the five-day cooling right. off period is the arraignment proceeding. And that there is, is no, there is no cooling off period. Really. I mean, there's no, there's no return of the firearms once the court orders that the person that, that's not right. possess. That's right. Until the court no longer orders the person not to possess. Yeah. As long as the case is and who's the burden? As long as the kid, unless the person's found not guilty, right? So there is no five days anymore. There is no five days. There is no hearing. And I'm not convinced that under the bill as originally drafted, that that five day hearing, if I read it correctly, uh, under uh, looks like uh, the copy I have, it's uh, page two. I don't have line numbers, but under Section B1, law enforcement agency in possession of a firearm shall return. So essentially, it's up to the the law enforcement to return the firearm. There was no hearing in the first one. Was. There was no hearing in the first one. And so no. Right. There was no hearing in the first one. Right. Unless, Unless the person. Original 422, right? Right. It says if the person requests the firearm return, right. and then if it's it gives the. But there is no. But. Can you envision a case of domestic violence where the judge would return the firearms? No, I cannot. No, I cannot. Even that's why I'm saying, even if the affidavit doesn't refer to firearms, you're going to have cases and uh, judges that will make the decision to impose a condition of you cannot possess firearms while this case is pending, even if it's not in the affidavit, because of the nature of the offense and the issues that surround domestic violence. And so, uh, I, clearly, if there is a firearm referred to in an affidavit, you can expect that there will be that condition of release imposed. The House side added that as a... So if, if we adopt the Attorney General's proposal, basically, there is no opportunity to return the firearms until the case is disposed That's correct. and the person's either found guilty or not guilty. And That's then if they're found guilty, they can't possess them anyway. That's correct. If they're found not guilty, then they would have. So that could be a year, could be six months, could be three months, could be whatever period it takes to resolve the case. That's correct. Okay. So we've gone from five days till forever. You've gone to the pendency of the matters before the court, which could either be the, the, the criminal proceeding or there could be a relief from abuse proceeding uh, where the conditions mirror each other. There's obviously different standards. So the only cases where somebody would not have firearm relinquished would be when they're cited down the road. I'm 
I'm sorry. The police officer goes to the home. Mm -hmm. There's two 18-year-olds fighting. They are brothers. Um, you know, brothers fight sometimes, as I understand it. Yes, I have a couple um, of brothers myself. And so the police officer, in order to get the situation under control, says, I'm citing you, Big Brother John, into court and your visit is two weeks from now. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have any relinquishment of firearms in that case until they go to court, and that might trigger it. But the, I mean, the officer doesn't see any need to take firearms. There's two brothers fighting, blah, blah, blah. Goes to the state's attorney. I, I'm, I'm trying to point a scene here where I understand. risk is an imminent. They're, Brothers get into a fight. I don't know why Mama called the police, but she did. So, if that, if they're cited and the police and the state's attorney decide not to contact the court to set conditions of release, right? To answer your question, yes, they could be cited so, in two weeks down the road, and there would be no conditions. No. Okay, uh, I was just trying to make sure there's a scenario where it's really fact specific and you could have scenarios where, where firearms won't be released. And that's where I again echo the, the comments of uh, the Defender General that these cases are very fact specific. So basically this bill does nothing you couldn't do now? With the exception of the concept of bringing the case in, this type of case right. in. And within, it, 20, within, within 24 within, hours. Within one business day. And that's my sense of this bill, yes. Okay. That, so that, other than that it does nothing that you couldn't do now? That's my sense of it. The police can confiscate firearms that, um, at the scene, if appropriate. Um, and if they come in the next day, I, that's why I say that to me is the most effective provision in this. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Senator Nitka had a note that it was fluff. We've been trying to figure out who called it fluff. I, I wouldn't call it fluff. No, not the bill, no. just the, the process. The process, yeah. So that was and, in the original House Pass version. And that's why that original bill, I think, was approaching this a different way. I look at it strictly as you start with the idea that someone is being arrested or cited. They're going to be charged, whatever way, form it takes, charged with a crime of domestic violence. And once that case comes before the court, either at that 2 o'clock in the morning phone call because they're seeking monetary bail, you can expect at that point in time, even if the judge makes a decision not to impose monetary bail, they will impose conditions appropriate to the, whatever information they get. Um, but even if they are lodged, the, uh, the judge will impose conditions of release that if the person makes bail during the night, <coughs> these are the conditions that apply. If we're not called, then to answer your earlier question. But that was what I was trying to get at. Exactly. I'm trying so, to describe situations where police might cite for domestic for misdemeanor domestic violence. As opposed to as coming opposed in the next to week. arrest. Um, so probably the best way to think of it is either they're lodged for under bail and conditions are set or there is a citation for some period out or there's a flash site is the right. common term we use for it citing the next day. And that's, the I think, the way for the committee to look at the different scenarios. Okay. Thank you. This is helpful, Judge. Joe? Flash sighting. Alleged victim is covered. They're protected. Because you can immediately give conditions of release. If they call us. In other words, the initial decisions made by the police and the state's attorney in that, are we just going to flashlight for tomorrow or are we going to call the court and ask for conditions? Let me rephrase if the person is in front of you at arraignment, whether it's the next day or the week down the road, at arraignment time, you get to issue the conditions of release that would remove the weapons. If S-221 as passed by the Senate was actually law, that would fill in the gap, would it not, whether they are cited for a week down the road or two months down the road. <coughs> Assuming the facts were proper and the court issued a 221 order, I'll call it for lack of better language, the protection is now there. 
It is. But I don't see that scenario happening. In the very, because the, the key to 221 is imminency. That if you don't take this firearm, and if it's, if it, it's arising out of a domestic violence incident, then I don't see that person, if you're on one hand saying, it's okay to let this person go for two weeks, but we need to take these firearms. I just don't see that scenario. If the police are calling me, they're calling me because they want conditions of release. They're not gonna bother with 221. They're gonna say, Judge, uh, we're gonna cite this person. We're not looking for bail, but we're looking for conditions of release. And if there's a firearm involved, if that person is in possession of a firearm, you can almost be assured that there will be a condition of release. Um, that there would be no condition. There would be condition. Would they, of, why would they cite him for down the road if they felt there was a continuing danger? My point exactly. That's why I don't think they would under that circumstance. Okay. If you couple the domestic violence incident with the imminency call for under 221, that to me is a cite the next day or a request to lodge. Okay. And I think the firearm will be taken not because. Uh, the the off, uh, uh, police officer or the state's attorney says, oh, what about 221, Judge? I'm going to say, here's a condition of release. That person cannot possess firearms, period. And if they make the decision after they've hung up, uh, they didn't ask for monetary bail, and if they decide that for whatever reason, maybe some of the reasons that Senator Sears referred to, they want to take a longer look at this case, uh, if they're not asking me for... Um, site the next day they can make that decision independent of the court but I would be issuing a condition of release no possession of firearms as opposed to the 221 procedure mm -hmm. that's why they're really two different scenarios and as soon as you start talking about domestic violence you might as well just remove 221 from your from your your thinking because the the, the domestic violence issues will drive the, the, the timing of the request, both by the police, the state's attorney, the nature of those requests, and the decision by the court. I don't know if you were, I'm sorry, Joe. I'm just rolling around in my head. I mean, if you cite over two weeks down the road, and information <clears throat> comes to the attention of the police that there's a growing threat in the, in the interim time period, it seems to me 221 gives you an avenue to get some relief there. Right. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't. If, if you're telling me that the, the night of the domestic violence incident, they don't ask, they don't involve the court, right. so there are no conditions. They just yeah. say, we're going to cite this case two weeks down the road. I agree with you that that doesn't stop them from um, proceeding under 221 in the interim. But again, you are talking about a domestic violence incident that's driving that, that is now two weeks down the road. And if that activity is continuing, I think you're going to be coming in on something other than a 221 request. Because, of, be, again, Senator, because of the underlying issues. Yeah. I, I, that's helpful because I, when I said 221 was limited, I didn't mean that it's limited in terms of, in terms of it needed vast improvement. I meant it was limited to certain cases where extreme risk is occurring. And the extreme risk, what you're saying, is if the extreme risk is associated with the case of domestic violence, then you would go the route of arrest or cite or whatever in order to uh, not only remove the firearm, but probably remove the individual from the scene. Right. Particularly if with a... Because there's reason to believe a crime was committed. However, in Connecticut, and where I'm coming from here is they ended up after the extreme risk in roughly 20 percent of the cases if i remember correctly making an arrest now i don't know if the arrest was for domestic violence or some other crime but after they investigated the extreme risk they did make arrests in a very in a small amount of the, about five about 20 percent of the cases so i think that's that it's possible Maybe unlikely, but possible. It's possible. I think the 221 but, population. But they are different bills. They, they are, are different. The 221 population, I view as a very <coughs> narrow population that doesn't involve mental illness on this end. It does not involve at this at the point where contacted 
domestic violence, either in the nature of relief from abuse or the crime, and the person hasn't shot that gun off in such a way that it becomes disorderly conduct or reckless endangering, then you're left with a true... Yeah, and that could be some of the crimes in Connecticut may have been reckless endangerment or whatever else after they investigated further. Can I, um, just changing focus for one second, on line nine of the Attorney General's proposal, there's the term, or any other person. Um, the ACLU has recommended that we move closer to the, to the rule three definition of household member. Um, have you any thoughts on that? Well, I didn't, I wasn't here early enough this morning to hear okay. uh, their testimony, so I wasn't sure what the rationale was, but I think they filed something with the committee. Yes, they and did. And if they did, I'll, I'll, read, uh, I'll okay. read that and... Uh, well, she basically I, said, uh, that a removal is allowed for the protection of the officer or any other person, not simply those who were involved in or are immediately adjacent to the alleged incident or to danger i.e. the alleged perpetrator, his family, and the alleged victim. It goes beyond domestic violence to any act where a person may attempt to inflict harm on any other person. Well, so they, they believe that's, that you can read it, and maybe if you want to comment later on it, that's fine. Um, it's obviously very broad. Uh, well, very any broad. other person, I mean, I, I was thinking Tiger Woods. I'm really upset with the way he played the other day. I'm, you know, I'm going to... I have to say that's one that did not occur to me. Is it? Well, I, but, but I understand. And well, no, it is to very. Me the other day when he was, yeah, yeah. I, I was upset that he didn't win. It, you know, it, it is extremely broad. And again, I think that is um, really a policy decision for the committee, but there's no question it, it expands it is the population. It's broad. Yeah, it's very broad. Um, so th those are my thoughts. I, it's not that the bill is not, um, I think that it does serve. Uh, a purpose. I, I think, as I said, the bringing a domestic uh, violence case into the court sooner rather than later, uh, I think, is appropriate. And since we're going to be seeing the case, there's there's no impact. But I, um, that's that's. Well, I'm going to plan to have about an hour on this next Tuesday to try to go over some of the ideas. Hopefully, we'll get through the witnesses tomorrow and not have you know to do. The group. So if you have further comments, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Thank you very much, Judge. Thank you. It's extremely helpful. It's nice to see you agreeing with that, Larry. <laughs> well, there's never a road so straight it doesn't have a curve in it. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> no, uh, just don't tell them I agree. I will, I, we will keep that between us. <laughs> Uh, we've only got about seven minutes left, so um, if David or Auburn or anyone wants to comment on something. Well, Auburn doesn't. She's leaving. If I can make a quick comment. Sure. Senator. Please do. Uh, uh, one Sorry. <laughs> I believe I was scheduled. You are scheduled, but I didn't think. Can you do seven minutes? I can do three. All right. You do three, and then we'll hear from David. Because it's all been said as far as I can tell. <laughs> Almost. Uh, Bill Moore, Vermont Traditions Coalition. I just uh, have been able, I've, I've been able to be upstairs on another bill, but I've also been able to um, be informed of uh, the Defender General's comments uh, to some detail, and also spoke with Chloe White. And I just want to reinforce that uh, I believe those comments generally would be similar to what I would have said here today. Not 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 at the attorney technical level that uh, I'm sure uh, was given. I'm certainly not an attorney, and I don't even play one on TV. Um, I, I agree with what Chloe's point is. I think it is. Uh, I think it's cloudy. Although Senator Paul Rand's Rand Paul's neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, maybe not, really maybe not a golf player. Right? Yeah. yeah. I think they had a fence. So um, I simply want to say that um, it, again, it is S two two one as passed by the Senate that we worked hard on and we feel addresses a lot of this. And not to forget that that bill, despite um, some of the comments just a few minutes ago by the judge, is still going to have a profound effect in areas such as suicide. <clears throat> so we shouldn't forget that the mission there is, is a broad one. 
Um, I, I also just, uh, I, again, in what I said upstairs, uh, S-221 as passed by the Senate clearly points out the limitations and deficiencies of the bill that you're considering today. And um, I only want to end by entering a couple of pieces of this into the record, if I could. Sure. Thank you. And I think it points out that the right is, is something that shouldn't be uh, messed with in uh, any low or um, lacking a due process method. So uh, article the first in the state constitution is that all persons are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights amongst which are the enjoying and defending of life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. So that clearly uh, uh, raises the bar pretty high for law enforcement. Um, Article the 10th, <coughs> little portion right there. Um, this is referring to uh, rights of persons accused of crime and waiver of jury trial. And there's a section in here that says, nor can any person be justly deprived of liberty except by the laws of the land or the judgment of the, of the person's peers. I think that indicates that a, a field process that lacks a due process and, and the court's interaction uh, is certainly suspect. Uh, Article the 11th, that the people have a right to hold themselves, their houses, papers, and possessions free from search or seizure, and therefore warrants without oath or affirmation first made, affording sufficient foundation for them, and whereby any office, officer or messenger may be commanded or required to search suspected places, or to seize any person or persons, his, her, or their property, not particularly described or contrary to that right, and ought not to be granted. And, uh, I will not repeat Article 16, the right to bear arms, because we all know it's an individual right, and we agree in that regard with the ACLU that it's an individual right. And I would end with Article 71 of the second chapter of the Constitution. The declaration of the political rights and privileges of the inhabitants of this state is hereby declared to be part of the Constitution of this Commonwealth and ought not to be violated on any pretense whatsoever. That's all I have for you. Joe has a question. Okay. Uh, the right to safety is not limited to the gun owner. That's correct. The alleged victim in a domestic case also has that right. That's correct. You had a bill come in here that called for a five-day turnaround time before due process kicked in, which is the way I would read. Now we have the, defense, the attorney general proposing a 24-hour turnaround any reaction to that? I'm perceiving that as an attempt to try to balance due process rights on the one hand and the right to safety on the other. I think the judge answered that, and I'm not an attorney, but I will say uh, five days, 14 days, or 60 days is suspect. But once you put enough due process up front and early, um, we're willing to walk along with that. So. Again, I'm not an attorney. 24 hours is an eternity for some people, but if you've been cited and remanded and had to wait till morning um, and go into be arraigned and released on a $50 bail or whatever it is for something semi-dangerous, um, well, I don't, I don't think there's a problem there. I think we have a right to intersect. Um, you can't expect the court to wait 24 hours a day on every every incident, so. Yeah, I defer to the judge. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I missed you. I, I lost my No, copy. that's all right. I didn't have much and it's all Agenda good. somewhere. I'm glad you reminded me of my agenda. <laughs> David, you're Thank not you. on the agenda. Uh, just very briefly, David Schneider for the Attorney General's office. Um, I will respectfully disagree with uh, the Chief Judge and the Defender General and state plainly what this bill does. This bill allows for police to take <coughs> guns that are not evidence of a crime. Right now, there is no lawful authority to do that. For the reasons I stated at length yesterday, we think it's essential that there be lawful authority to do that, and that's what this bill does. I can, uh, <laughs> I can expound on other thoughts, but we, but, that's the key message I want to give to this committee. This bill is doing important work, work that is not being done by any other law presently, 
and that's why we feel that it is uh, important for this committee to pass. And, and we, as you know, we put forth a version that we feel addresses many of the due process and constitutional concerns that have been raised. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and what you know, comes even clearer to me through the testimony this week is that the House passed bill was deficient in, due, in that regard of the due process right. I don't want to... Uh, I, you don't have to comment on that. I just, you know, I said that a couple of months ago and got into trouble. I think that your rewrite is, much, is, is an improvement, a vast improvement, but I, I do think I'd love to hear your comments next week on um, the other person narrowing that and the, uh, the judge's comments on line 14, a person cited or arrested and dropping the word cited. And I'd need a little more time to look at some No, I, that's language, why I'm saying to me yeah, next week. That sounds good. There seem to be two key areas where the committee may wish to make changes from your original version of the bill. And I'm happy to work with folks to make Not this your, bill. Uh, the Attorney General's, your, uh, the Attorney General's <laughs> proposal of amendment right. to the bill, those two, and there's a, one or two others. Yeah. Cite. Removing the word cite. Uh, other person. Changing other person to more closely resemble the Rule 3 definition of household member and right. and eight. You want to add from imminent harm. From imminent harm. So it's protection from imminent harm. The reason for that is to make sure that there's an ability for the um, law enforcement officer to talk to any counselor or any other person who might be working with this person to know that what we might be dealing with right. could be significant. Um, and the that helps you to deal with that. Uh, the law enforcement have testified in, on other matters that it's often difficult to talk with a counselor or whomever is dealing with this person unless you can. What was the I think those are the main steps. We talked about adding exigent circumstances to the list of yeah, I, uh, it, exceptions to the warrant. But okay. And I'm happy to work with Eric and the other folks who have testified. But those are the work on those ideas issues. To, from your draft. I'm happy to hear from the victim's community and the state's attorneys and anyone out of the firearm, uh, the groups supporting firearms rights. Uh, I do want to make clear or make sure that um, whatever we do, we can pass constitutional muster that's And I'm happy if it, it would be useful for the committee. I'm happy to reduce to written form the constitutional uh, discussion that we had. Well, it might be helpful because I didn't. I read over the the um, special needs doctrine and didn't see. I read it actually while we were on the floor today. In that article, I mean, with all yeah, the that article, that article. Really <laughs> I, it was to firearms. It spoke. That's exactly right. And I think yeah. because of that, it's not. It's so hard helpful. to understand how that fits with the constitutional exception. Yeah, I think you're you're right to uh, well, worry about that. I think I can provide um, the written explanation of what I gave yesterday, where yeah. where the fire this particular firearms bill fits in with it. And I, I'm happy to do that. Okay, that would be helpful. That's good. I've got another meeting at noon time, so I need to. On PFOA, my favorite subject. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.